Go ahead. Um, this would be mainly for Dr. Elpis, I guess. You were getting at, I think there was a lot of data there, but something about modal uh, education and, I mean, you can imagine the amount of variation that there is with the arts or music education. So, uh, and how that might reflect on some of these studies that we were talking about that, you know, actually help uh, students later. They have to learn to play an instrument, right, in order to really get these gains. But all we're trying to get into the schools is uh, some sort of exposure, whether it's, you know, the history of art or whatever. So, I mean, that should probably be addressed in policy. So, that's hot. Uh, I, would suggest, I, would, I would counter that and say most arts educators did not get into arts education to sort of create a passive experience for students. That when you look at the people who are teaching the arts in the schools, they're looking to get kids making music, making art, making dance, making theater. And that's essentially how we prepare music educators at the University of Maryland and most of my colleagues across the nation do as well. But what counts as arts education does have a lot of variation. And when you look at national data, all that variation does get washed away. Yeah. So that's, yeah. But even just vocal, you know, singing would be a lot easier than playing an instrument, right? It's also cheaper. It's because cheaper, Because you don't yes. need to buy the but instruments. But still, I mean, the level of, uh, you know, how much you have to invest would be a lot more for a student to have to play an instrument. Is that, I mean, that's makes sense, unless you're going to be an opera singer. Right. I would, I would suggest that um, I, as a choral person myself, I give, um, I don't make as, uh, as much of a difference between students singing together uh, for some of the synchrony benefits and things like that as students playing instruments together. I know there's less charitable investment in um, getting, for example, a certified choral teacher in every school than there might be to purchase a brand new set of Yamaha instruments for certain schools that might not have the ability to procure those on their own. And I think that the investment in arts education uh, can be shaped at the local level by people who are informed by, by, so long as the students are actively engaged in art making, I think they'll um, get the benefits that, that the research suggests are available to them. They don't have to read music, though, at a very low level to sing, right? I mean, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Okay, Stephanie Bird. Um, so one of the take-home messages that I got was that there is a real advantage to having had, in your early years, training with music, music in particular with instruments. So with a practical application to current days, for older people, I'm wondering whether or not Dr. Levitan's um, grandmother's keyboard would address Dr. Krauss's issue about how much better uh, hearing loss in musicians is counteracted um, that compared to uh, elder people with hearing loss who haven't been musicians. You can share. You, I'm sure you both have valuable opinions on this topic. <laughs> so, so we know. Um, I'm wired up, right? Um, so, so we know from, from a, a neuroscience perspective that uh, you know it, 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 that the, the nervous system continues to change. We continue to learn. We continue to learn uh, through sound until we die, and uh, you know this is shown very nicely with uh, you know controlled experimental animal work. Um, in, there is a considerable amount of research showing that. Uh, auditory training and, and various forms of training in older adults uh, can change the biology of, um, of, of uh, sound processing in the brain uh, and uh, communication and cognitive skills. Um, there is evidence that uh, music training begun later in life uh, has some uh, cognitive and social benefits. I don't know uh, we, we wanted to, to, to look at this neurobiologically. This was one of the, uh, the, the many NIH grants that failed. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 th I think that, that uh, based on what we do know about the neuroscience of um, learning, that um, people can learn no matter when they start. 
So just so in terms of a larger public policy issue, given that hearing loss is going to be increasing, especially given the prevalence of earbuds and loud music, et cetera, I'm just thinking about uh, to what and the fact that certainly our older adults probably haven't had the access to music and music training as much in their childhoods as a general population issue. Um, so I'm thinking about whether or not you would suggest, I mean, I given that hearing loss really undermines uh, cogni cognitive um, or increases cognitive decline. I'm just wondering if you would tend to think that we could be optimistic about this or if there's any evidence that, that it's the case, that is, that uh, some kind of music training for elders would be uh, helpful with respect to hearing I don't, loss. I don't know of any evidence that um, music training in elders helps with hearing loss, but there's an emerging body of evidence that musical training in elders, even if they're learning to play an instrument for the first time or just continuing to play an instrument, does help to stave off Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. And part of that, uh, I, wanna, I don't want to claim that music does this uniquely. Uh, it seems as though you get the same benefit from learning a new language or traveling uh, and uh, you're doing crossword puzzles. Uh, the, Largest factor that seems to be associated with cognitive decline, however, is the declining social circles, the you know, shrinking sh social circles of many people. When they leave the workforce, they suddenly don't have a large number of people to interact with. And interacting socially is one of the most complex things that we do. And so that helps to keep the brain active and in shape. And playing music with other people is just one way to do that, but not, not uniquely, it seems. OK, good, thank you. Hi. Uh, this question isn't really targeted for anyone, but I'm curious to hear any opinions. Uh, so we hear there's a lot of expressive benefits and cognitive and neurological benefits to music making throughout the lifespan. But uh, with the necessity to establish a better uh, framework and infrastructure from the policy standpoint, uh, does anyone have any ideas on potential pitfalls or way to manage the over structuralization of music and policy making. So sort of taking the expressiveness or the, the empathic quality out in an idea to standardize it for everyone across the country so that they have the access to it. Do you want to take that? Sure. <laughs> Uh, I, would, I would suggest at that moment is when you need to actively resist the urge to assess the arts in a standardized fashion. And I, that seems almost absurd to suggest that people want to standardize um, and assess the arts, but there's a large movement to do that. And in fact, some of the larger urban school districts currently purchase um, uh, a product from a certain um, testing company that claims that it can assess uh, arts learning. And I, th I like to refer to uh, Bennett Reamer, who is a ph philosopher of music education who recently passed away, who refers to different kinds of arts learning, and he was specifically interested in music, and he referred to uh, things like knowing about music. So knowing when Mozart lived is knowing about music, which unfortunately in some states would count as music education. But he also talks about knowing through music, which is where you see music used as a way to teach like the quadratic formula. Uh, and the way that probably most arts educators are interested in knowing within music, which is the actual making and doing of music, the creation of original expression and sound, the ability to process the emotional and feelingful content of music. I think ultimately the goal of aesthetic education in any modality is to deepen the connection of our students with their own aesthetic emotional lives. And the aesthetic distance that Ping was talking about is probably, uh, I think, the linchpin in what arts education should be doing from a philosophical and not neurobiological standpoint. I just wanted to say that sort of the rebel in me says that the way that with the tail has to kind of wag the dog. So if the strategy that we're trying to, to do is to get it in, you know, after school programs, get it into school programs, because those are the people who are gonna grow up to be the advocates. And if they had a positive experience and these uh, more recreational approaches, I think um, can broaden the uptake of the arts in the way that you're talking about where there's, it's less, you know, it might have to be done outside of school, but we've actually, because of, of having an evidence-based program, schools are willing to adopt the program that we're offering, which is not 
product and you know it's not ori oriented the same way with the measurement standards and the curriculum standards. And in this way, we also increase the exposure and the positive experience that kids have. I just want, I wanted to say one thing about outcomes. So um, I got involved in the Harmony Project, which is uh, in, in uh, the gang reduction zones of LA, because they had their own outcomes. And their outcomes was that in these very impoverished areas of town, uh, these kids who were in the Harmony Project you know, became the first in their uh, family to, to graduate from high school. And they beat the odds of, um, of, of you know, not ending up in jail. And uh, they, they had all kinds of, of um, important social outcomes. And you know, then you know, they, came, they came to me asking what's going on in their brains. Um, but you know, they had, I think, some very important measurable outcomes that have nothing to do with how good they are at playing their instrument. Uh, speaking of outcomes, I, I don't like standardized testing because I think that in general, uh, it can miss a lot of the creativity and individuality that helps distinguish somebody who might be really bright but not able to show it in a conventional way. Um, I, had a, I was having an argument with a colleague who was uh, creating GRE questions for the uh, educational testing service, and they had this question, which one does not belong? Golf, tennis, football, or um, squash? And I think that the answer that ETS wanted was football doesn't belong because it's the only sport of those mentioned that doesn't require some kind of an implement. But it seemed to me that you could make an, a good argument for golf that it doesn't belong because it's the one of those that you could play by yourself and still get a meaningful score, or tennis because the scoring system isn't you know, consecutive numbers the way it is in the others. And while we're having this argument, my friend's daughter uh, at seven years old comes into the room and she says, you two are both wrong. Squash doesn't belong, it's a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's the problem with standardized testing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this panel. It was very informative and was sure engaging all of our senses. Uh, I have a question mainly to Dr. Krauss, and that is, um, We've talked about synchronizing to another individual while playing music. We've talked about like identifying a rhythm in noise and so on. This all applies to playing music. It also applies to singing music, but it also applies to social dancing. So what do so you, you have like any opinion have some, on that? Yeah, so with, with, with further um, NIH federal funding, uh, Surely there are scientists who would like to systematically look at the impact of, of dancing on uh, various aspects of, of uh, uh, learning. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no studies certainly looking at, at, at the kinds of, uh, of sound processing that uh, we look at that are important for language skills um, in dancers. Uh, but you know, this is one of many studies that really remains to be done and remains to be informed by knowledge. It's a really important question. Thank you. Hi, and thanks for the session. It's, I don't typically attend these, but um, it was, I just had to do it today. I don't know why. I was very touched by the guitar, and the, so I got a personal point. One is the, the babies dancing to the guitar they look like they were about eight months, six months old, something like that. And the reason it was, it really hit me is because I'm a drummer, and um, I used to, drums are loud, and uh, when my wife was about seven months pregnant, when I would play, she, the, she'd say, oh my goodness, the baby's like, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm like, well, maybe the, he's, the baby's scared. <laughs> so I go, because it's really loud, so I started playing exactly the same thing with no rhythm, then I varied the rhythms, and samba was the baby's favorite. <laughs> Seven months. So, from a, so that's a personal note. So when I saw that, I was like, oh my god, that's what was happening. Anyways, they clearly, they've, they've developed this ability to, the musicality is so young, it's unbelievable. So, so then I have a scientific question. How early do you think that forms? All right, and then another thing that um, a lot of the work I do deals with, you know, the brain initiative and things like that. 
and one question that keeps emerging in a lot of workshops is what makes us human, you know, and distinguishes us. And it seems like you might be at a place that does that. So I'm, I'm curious if there's other... Yeah, let's, let's, let's start on the how early. <laughs> how early, no, that. but then it, are, are there primates that have some of this ability? So that, I just sort of wonder... You don't get a, six questions. <laughs> <laughs> I can start on the how early, uh, which is that uh, by the age of 16 weeks, the auditory system of the fetus is fully functional and it can hear through the amniotic fluid in the womb. It's hearing mostly low frequency information because the amniotic fluid acts as a low pass filter. So the developing uh, fetus is learning chord progressions and rhythms through the amniotic fluid and we find that infants uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, in the first year of life show a preference for music that they heard in the womb. Uh, I'll turn it over to Nina for the next part of the question. What about what makes us human? <laughs> Yikes. Uh, you know, the only thing that, that, that is, is kind of an interesting observation is with respect to rhythm is that there are few animals outside of, of humans and, and uh, some birds that, uh, that, that feel the beat that tap along to a beat, like, you know, your dog is not going to be wagging his tail to the beat. And, um, and, and this seems to be part of, a, of an auditory motor uh, link that probably in, is important for, for imitating um, and, uh, and vocalization. Uh, also, we're doing some work with, with drummers and... Uh, I thought you worked with musicians. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, there, there are some um, uh, rhythmic aspects of speech that involve, um, that, that are important for following a, a, a person's, uh, what, what they're saying in noise, and um, the percussionists seem to be especially good at following, and, and now we're not talking about the beat, we're talking about the rhythm, um, you know, to, I don't even need this, to, to, to I, I, I can't use it, um, you know, to, to use the example that, uh, um, you know, like shave and a haircut to bits, you know, this is, this is the, the beat, but is the rhythm, right? And, um, and, and this is the part that also tracks with the words and tracks with the notes, and, um, and, and these, these skills, by the way, are dissociable. Um, and, and drummers are, you know, pretty good at, at both of them, but especially this rhythm skill is one that seems to track with being able to make sense of, of, of language in a complicated listening environment. Because, you know, there's rhythm in language, but, you know, language is not metronomic, but it does have a rhythm that um, you can learn to follow better and not so well. So I had a couple comments and then a, and a question also. And the one comment I have relates to what you were just talking about. I was always sort of fascinated, like, why animals don't hear music or don't relate to music. And one of the things I thought was is that for some reason there's a cognitive ability that humans, that's, that is unique to humans, is anticipation. So we can go one, two, one, two, three, and the band comes in on one. So we have an ability to anticipate, perhaps, that animals don't have. And your imaging thing, I thought, actually supported that in a way, because when there was an interlude of the music, there was still brain activity. So it was anticipating that something was coming up. I don't know if that's something you've thought about or not. The other thing, um, <clears throat> I've read a couple of things about uh, jazz singers, primarily females, who don't read music but understand the form of the music and are really good, you know, classic jazz singers. And they talked about um, thinking of the music in terms of colors and not in terms of notes. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how that might be playing into like a sense of color in terms of you know how you listen or how you express express something like that, I, I can take your your first question, um, which, which, which is you know like in, in animals, uh, people have really tried to teach monkeys, for example, to anticipate a beat, 
and, and, and they won't. They're really good at perceiving temporal differences, but they won't do that synchronization. Um, you want to handle the color? Yeah, I'll just add that Michael Petritus uh, has uh, shown that the macaque is missing a critical area of the prefrontal cortex that we have between Broadman 44 and Broadman 47 which has been implicated in humans in anticipating what's going to come next right. in an auditory and, and sequence. the ability so, maybe to project into the future. Right. It, it, uh, to track and uh, temporal, temporal sequences, either visual or auditory sequences and make prediction, seems to be occurring in this part of the prefrontal cortex that our primate uh, cousins don't have. On the, um, uh, what was the other? Color. Uh, oh, oh, color. Uh, uh, yeah, and reading music. You know, I, I, I don't wanted... know that that's universal, but I remember reading some, you know, about someone who. Well, I, and I don't I, remember who it was. It might have been like Dinah Washington or somebody, but you know, who who projected music into uh, shades of color. Yeah. Well, so setting aside the color question for just a moment, I think it's important to uh, to note that um, reading music is something that's relatively recent in our history. We've been a music-making species for at least 50,000 years. That's the age of bone flutes and other musical instrument artifacts that have been found. But we didn't have the ability to write music down and read it until about 500 years ago. And it follows the, uh, the same story that we have with language. People were certainly telling stories for tens of thousands of years before they were writing them down. So I don't think of reading and writing music as being a prerequisite to musical expertise or musical ability. It's just something else, some t a tool that some people have and other people don't. Paul McCartney doesn't read or write music, and um, I wouldn't say that he's not a good musician or a good composer. Uh, and then you've got other people who do read and might write music who aren't as good. So I think that's an orthogonal issue. The tone color association may be a form of synesthesia, which Scriabin had and um, some musicians have. And it's just, it's not a metaphor. It's not that they hear a note and they have the sense of pink. They actually have visual activity, uh, which we've seen in imaging experiments, right. uh, it, it corresponding to colors. And so it, that's just another avenue for keeping track of and systematizing some way of memorizing sequences, I think. So since you were talking about the, the, um, the, the, the uh, primates, I remember there's a thing on NPR that I thought was very interesting. It was some guy who was a, a cello player, and he played with one of the heavy metal bands. And he started thinking about um, what were primates hearing, or why didn't they hear music. And he presented music that humans uh, would listen to to the primates, and they didn't really respond to it. But then he listened to their language and their screeching, and then he tried to present music in that form, which something were related more to their vocal thing, and he found that they responded to it, which I thought was kind of interesting. So the other thing I wanted to take exception was, <laughs> was your one slide where you show the little girl playing piano and you put Chopin and, and uh, Mozart or whatever. And I would suggest that you modify that because some of us like to emulate people like Oscar Peterson or Bill Evans. And since I'm living in Texas now, I should say Stevie Ray Vaughan. And there's a culture there of music. I mean, those people were masters of taking all the influences that they had and putting it into the music. So I would make it more Americana or something yeah. like that, I guess. Fair enough. Well, I think we, our time has come to an end. I want to thank you, thank the panelists again, and thank you for your participation.